I think we lost you for a second. Uh, All right. Give me one second. Let me know. Yeah. Am I back now? You're back. Why don't you pop your slides up? I think we hear you on room audio. Yeah. Is that good? It's fine. It's fine. Okay. okay sounds good. Um, cool. So over a few months. And slides. Uh, slides. I don't see the share screen anymore. Uh, I do see one second. Okay. Good now. Okay. Um, so over the few months, we started seeing Content Graph leading a promising path forward. And with excellent call volumes and many potential use cases it could support, it became quite clear that we need to add like tracing support and monitor live traffic performance actively. We pushed all the tracing data to our in-house uh, metric storage system and viewed graphs on Grafana like very uh, meticulously. Very soon, we started thinking about how we can show reviews data and salaries data information via Content Graph, which would look something like this. And guess what? Before we knew it, uh, we were taking production traffic for reviews and salaries roughly at 50,000 uh, requests per minute. And all of this was through Content Graph uh, serving under 250 milliseconds latency. OK, that was the past. I'm going to do a time travel here to present day. Uh, but I'll come back up uh, with the journey shortly. And yes, this is really what it looks like now. It's still very simplified. And uh, you know I have abstracted a lot of the information around this. But on the top right, you can see our incubating projects uh, also hitting the live cluster during development. Once they're ready uh, to be served for public use, we harden them, and then we and move it to the production zone. You can see how complex Content Graph has become now with a lot of services under its parasol of services. Uh, you see you have four more graph layers called the Atlas graph, the profiles graph, uh, the collections graph, and the jobs graph. And all of these graph layers have nearly similar counts of services they talk to, just like the content graph. Also, in addition to this, this is just a live cluster. We have the exact same setup for batch as well. And it serves roughly around 100 million to 150 million requests per day. And new services gets onboarded roughly around one, or one to two every month. What does this uh, give you the impression of? Like this infrastructure is super critical to function correctly. And it has too many servers to manage and maintain. Moving on. So federation is the next phase of the talk. And uh, we will talk about why we made this switch to federation and what did we do around it. So a big part, like today, federation is a con cornerstone of our engineering vision at Glassdoor. Once in a while, you get one product idea that seems easy at first. But to implement that at scale, you need to rethink the whole architecture bottom up. Yes, we had one of those curve walls a new product called Collections. The MVP of this product was essentially a native app, uh, which users could use to perform job and company search and uh, use it as a clipboard for storing and any of your research that you have done throughout your job search process. At first, we spent a week developing API requirements for this. And uh, it came down that we needed four APIs per type and also more APIs on top of that to access the collections repository. The main challenges we faced were primarily around the number of client requests that we would get, as well as at any time we realized that a user could have five to 16 collections stored, which would require 25 to 40 calls to render the entire view. We also needed to hit many data points in real time because data had the propensity to change relatively quickly. For example, view jobs, which you see here, for a user can range between 20 to 40 jobs. And each of those data points come from four different services. Jobs can expire. And we also need to check whether this job is explicitly available in the search index before displaying it to the user. So there's a lot of this business complexity. This viewability, this tracking, this data eligibility, is all controlled by the business logic centralized at individual services. And we started having 
real concerns of duplicating them. There were concerns of ownership, there were concerns of maintenance, and this got us all thoroughly worried. What do you do when you're worried? You start doing your research and figure something out uh, soon enough. So we started our research and given that Content Graph already had like 30% of the data we needed, uh, we were excited to explore this path a bit farther and see if Federation approach could help us. We read the principal GraphQL blog. Uh, most of you might have read this already and we were inspired to try it out. Uh, while there were many ways we could have approached this, the biggest driver for us was when you, this statement really, like when you need commonly used business entities that are already available via an existing graph, you look no further, but you start reading up on Federation. Step one for us was to just add another service. We think a node-based Apollo server serves the, quick, serves the quickest, uh, most well-documented way of starting with GraphQL, especially when you have a REST service backing your data. We built one quickly, but ours hit a brand new database directly from a node app, which is also the first at Glassdoor. We generally use Java-based services. Most importantly, we had to ensure that this had a shared schema between the two graph apps and which enabled us to perform the next step. For step two, we created a new graph gateway server that operates with a static service list where one of the graph servers was our new content graph, uh, was our new service, which was collections graph. And the other one was the existing service, uh, which was deployed to QA. Following the standard path of doing federation, uh, we ended up adding at key directive for the entity that needs to be exposed via graph. And on the consumer side, add extend marking the key field as external where, where the next steps. Uh, using static lists lets you change destinations during development really quickly. And with debug logs and query tracing on uh, Apollo Gateway, you can see exactly what Apollo server is doing. So that helps you build that muscle while writing federated queries. Step three would be the part which would be different for most of you. We realized that uh, our version of GraphQL that was used for Content Graph didn't speak the Federation language. So we had to reverse engineer and given upgrading was way too painful. And in this case, what we ended up doing was we emulated the two queries that are needed uh, for Federation to work, the schema query SDL and the entity representations query. We also added an annotation to deal with the whole resolver setup and that enabled us to move ahead really quickly without upgrading anything. And this made this whole system work perfectly. As soon as everything was running, we needed remote schemas management. And uh, this is basically an ability to store a composed schema remotely and valid enable users to validate before pushing a change to a schema such that it doesn't break the master schema. We had a lot of engineers working on this and in the early days, uh, composition breakage pre-production was common. If you got to go into Federation, this is an important part because you need to develop that muscle memory for your engineers. This slide uh, is mostly about some of the operational insights that we gained. At this point, uh, the new application was already in production and it, had, uh, being, it was still being A-B tested. And this is, uh, the ordered list of things that we found most critical to our success. Moving to manage federation is the effective first step, like I just said. And if you have a team of more than three, go for it. More important, when you want partial changes to go out and you want to set them out as soon as they're ready, we didn't do this soon enough, which cost us valuable dev cycles, uh, trying to figure out why which server is dependent on which other server and getting everything running. Automate client push and operation registry uh, generation, like all the, uh, you can essentially use ESLint plugin uh, that exists today uh, with unique operation names and named operation support. That goes a long way. If you don't do this, when you start your project, you spend a lot of time getting teams to follow this eventually. Note that this is also necessary for securing your graph. Next, development time monitoring of query performance. It is very easy to add another subtree to your graph request given the nature of how graph works. 
knowing the query traits or having access to existing product performance metrics of the query is key. Once this goes to production, it's actually often too late. This is something to be really mindful of. We had some queries which turned out to be pretty slow when it went into production. We had to switch off the test and do the process again. Then security should never be an afterthought, especially for graphs. There is a bit of extra vectors that we need to think about, and I will talk about it in the next set of slides, but something to keep in mind. Then tracing. Traditional reporting services which logs response time at network layer and do not show details of the user input are often unusable as a valid method to find performance of a query. Pushing the data to a metric server like Apollo Engine or even an in-house setup like Prometheus or graphite-based implementation is good enough, but it is necessary. Alerting on failed queries uh, or long-running queries are also equally important and revealing. We have found that this one user who kept hitting our GraphQL endpoint every day morning with random inputs. Like the daily Apollo reports that uh, are sent over Slack helps us as a lagging indicator for finding bad actors and even highlighting slow queries. Next, given we are a Java node and Python shop, um, where Python is actually mostly used for machine learning applications, a choice that we had often to deal with was to choose between Java-based graph services or node-based graph services. After discussion over the years that I've been a part of, this is the final list of things uh, that we feel made sense to us. And we have this decision model sent over to our engineering teams and they roughly use this. So Java-based graph services are really good for high memory needs with large amount of caching requirements. On the node side, it is great for high network calls with less caching. Java-based services are good where you have a lot of spring injected uh, business logic already available for reuse. Uh, node side is good where you have REST clients, like you just call REST and you get the data, compose the data and return back. Java Graph team releases features a little bit sporadically, so you, would, you should be okay with waiting for a feature a little bit longer. Apollo GraphQL is more comfortable with uh, engineers who are JavaScript friendly and they write, uh, they love the directives, they love like React uh, and client APIs that Apollo has written. Uh, Apollo Link Boost are some of the other things. Uh, passive community involvement for the Java side of things. Uh, we, we used to have a bunch of questions and we found that the process is a little bit slower. Uh, in the node-based world, Apollo server world, uh, we have seen a lot of active community support, especially with Spectrum Chat, uh, and with uh, you know we have been able to reach reach out to the engineers really quickly through GitHub, uh, and got solutions for our problems. The instrumentation support in Java uh, is present, but it needs some more work, and uh, it needs work to wire it up. It needs uh, some additional things we need to think about. The Node-based version is actually almost codeless. All you need to do is configure the engine key. So that has really worked for us. Okay, now let's talk about security. For a site which has 65 plus million content serving 50 million users, uh, security is important when graph is used to access majority of the data displayed to the user and is available on the edge. I have simplified all the layers into four, and I assume that you would have something very similar. The four logical splits are the edge layer, the API gateway layer, the Apollo graph gateway layer, and the subgraph layer. I'll go into details of each layer and what security practices we are following. The topmost in your edge layer is where you rely on your DNS provider. Uh, we work with Cloudflare, and Cloudflare protects us from DOS attacks but we do have rate limiting uh, on this slash GraphQL endpoint. We also use uh, Cloudflare to block spurious IPs when we auto detect spurious activity by our internal alerting system. The next layer is the API gateway layer. You can imagine uh, this to be something like Amazon API gateway or some of your like custom, some teams have custom build services, some teams have uh, Nginx as well. Uh, we actually use an ultra fast um, custom build service, uh, which uh, with a lot of configuration flexibility. Uh, like it is as easy as configuring it into an YAML and it just works. Uh, some of these things that we do here are as follows. So 
we have the AT token validation. Uh, this is similar to a JWT token where we and we check the expiry. We also check whether it was generated by us uh, using our dynamically rotated key. And we also validate if this token has access to that specific path. Next is CSRF. Uh, this is used to know if the same server who has generated the token is also the one consuming the token. Uh, we do this to prevent cross-site request forgery. Uh, this token expires pretty quickly and it's constantly regenerated by the client of the graph query. Uh, advanced bot detection is pretty interesting. We detect uh, spurious uh, access by IP, by operation name, by, by ASNs, uh, by complexity. Uh, so we have custom built uh, this bot detection service uh, that uses our access data, uh, access logs pretty much, uh, to dynamically place the user activity in, set of, in a set of clustered buckets. We rank those buckets to determine if somebody is spuriously accessing our site. Uh, at this layer, we also do propagate a header if we know that the request was made from good known bots. Uh, we also do the usual thing about uh, the uh, IP ranges check, knowing if it's coming from an AWS IP and things like that, uh, and block them up front. We do have functionality underneath to route to the bot servers when a request actually comes from good bots. So that's why we need those flags. Next slide is really where I would spend most of the time before we end the presentation. And uh, security practices we have implemented on the graph gateway layer uh, is a lot. And it's important to know what we have done here. In general, anything graph specific goes in this layer. So AT token revalidation. Uh, so this is similar to the check that we do in the previous layer, uh, but also done here because here there are internal services which hit those uh, graph gateway directly. Say, for example, a node server-side rendered app. Uh, so that calls this graph layer to get the entire page data that is SEO friendly. At this layer, we also decode the token and we add headers uh, to the Apollo context before forwarding the request to our subgraphs. These are examples like these are user IDs um, and other information for uniquely identifying or record an entity in the database. Uh, or any third party system for that matter. We also check for known clients and operations with Apollo operations registry plugin. Um, no nameless queries, no unregistered queries are allowed through. If we receive any of this, we record them in our logging system and our advanced bot detection service picks this information up to block the attacker upstream when more requests come in from the same, uh, having the same problems. Complexity is the next important thing. We statically compute the query depth of an incoming query, flag it uh, if the query is beyond a max expected value configured by query name. Uh, additionally, we dynamically compute the query cost of an incoming query without actually running the query. And then we have hard limits, again, configurable by the query name. If we receive anything uh, beyond what we expect, uh, we always flag them and it follows that same process. We also use uh, this new thing called as rate limiting by complexity. And we are in the middle of implementing that. Uh, so this will enable our API partners to reliably use our platform for specific sets of queries they have access to. So this is a uh, rate limit by complexity of the query. Complexity can be cost plus depth. Uh, we also are in the middle of uh, implementing auth directives for our schema directly for, from, uh, for enabling our subgraph layers to do less work uh, by checking roles and authorization rights right up front, especially for mutation queries. We also hide uh, our using a super level query formatter that hides all of our stack traces and prevents those from getting exposed to the query client. Uh, we also have hard query timeouts and we get benchmarking data every day for our slowest and our fastest query. And these values, are, these timeouts are dynamically computed and uh, configured in the code. So similarly, we also have max value for page size inputs uh, so that you know, our client cannot create a request which has very high page size and that ends up crippling our systems underneath. Last but not the least, uh, because we do a combination of alerting strategies, uh, we 
use multiple logging platforms, and uh, we also use Apollo Studio. So we push some tracing data to Apollo Engine. And this tracing data is basically a unique request ID that can be traced down to our logs to review user activity and make a block no block decision. The last layer is validating data access at your code level is super important, especially for mutations and oftentimes for authorized cases. So if a resume needs to be downloaded, the resume should actually match the AD token the, from the, uh, for, which gives you the user ID. And this is where developers should not assume that the layers above are going to take care of it. Derive when possible, so derive as much as possible uh, instead of exposing inputs uh, to the query. This is an easy vector for IDOR attacks and they should be rejected. For mutations, make sure that you clean up XSS during save. Uh, you can choose to deny a save upstream if you find XSS in the input data, which might be handy, but uh, we have generic helpers and this allows us to uh, you clean XSS throughout the process of the stack. So that's all for the talk. Uh, today, what we talked about is three areas, uh, you know, the history, how we scaled, and the uh, security aspects. I'm happy to take any questions and willing to share some code in the breakout sessions or even now, if that helps. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I did not think that about Glassdoor, <laughs> looking at it from the outside. Um, that's, that's really impressive. We have zero time for questions, unfortunately, uh, but you can definitely message uh, message him directly. Uh, I think there's also like a networking feature or you can invite to a private chat or things like that. And maybe you can get some uh, answers questions. There's some great questions in there. Maybe you can find those and, and yeah. uh, feed off of those or message those people directly. Um, fantastic talk, really appreciate it. Uh, and again, another, uh, the last minute, one of the last minute speakers to come in. So um, thank you. That was great. Real, real brass tacks of GraphQL in the enterprise. So thank you. Okay. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Vladimir, Managing Security and Authorization in GraphQL. This should be a really good talk. Uh, Vladimir has been around the block a lot when it comes to these kind of topics. Uh, working at Screen, uh, core contributor to Node.js. I mean, he knows, he knows some stuff. So uh, I'm not going to take any more of his time. Please uh, give us... Give us your goods. Thanks a lot for the intro. I will try to uh, be as good as you depicted me. Um, so this should share my screen. Is that correct? I hope so. Let me just do two seconds of window management. I apologize immediately, but I will be looking at this screen because I've got like a dual thing and uh, the webcam is obviously not where it should be. Um, so let's go for this talk about um, GraphQL with a security perspective. Um, as introduced, I'm Vladimir de Turkem. I work at Screen uh, where I do Node security full-time and I'm also part of the Node.js security team. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want. And I have a confession to make, I'm not a GraphQL expert. Um, my field of expertise is web application security and I actually do two things in my life. I protect applications and I break applications. And from time to time, I also build things. And uh, what I want to bring to this talk is the perspective from someone who is at the same time a developer, but also a security person through GraphQL. So in this whole talk, we will consider that GraphQL is another way to exchange data between a client and a server. And we will see what will be the perspective of a hacker when meeting GraphQL. So GraphQL is an abstraction and it's designed to make your life better. It enables you to build better application faster. And the first time I discovered GraphQL, I was just feeling like a, like a turtle on a rocket. It just like feels the future and so powerful. But abstractions sometimes can make you forget about implementation details. And as a hacker, as a security person, the most important at the end of the day is implementation details. That's where the fun happens. And probably I'm going too fast and I'm spoiling the major past of my talk. So let's 
dig into one question is who would one attack a GraphQL app? Um, I don't plan in giving you tools to be to destroy applications that are presented into the, in this conference, but I want to give you the perspective of the process uh, of who a hacker malicious or not malicious would go to break a GraphQL application. And without any surprise, I guess the first thing a hacker should do is to identify that the application is actually using GraphQL because otherwise there is no need into knowing anything about GraphQL hacking if you want to break into REST or other kind of APIs. So, okay, it's pretty easy. Uh, have you heard of this tool named Wapalizer? It's basically an add-on you can add to Chrome and I recommend actually everyone who is interested in tech to have this add-on. And it tells you which are the libraries used by your website. And here I was browsing Airbnb sooner today and I see they have Apollo somewhere. So I can expect them to use GraphQL somewhere. Of course, GraphQL is not only used for a browser facing application, it can be used for mobile application, but we have a set of tools to analyze either the application code, if it's a mobile application, either the application network traffic, and that's pretty much how we detect that an application is using GraphQL. We will find GraphQL related libraries, we will find posts request to a slash GraphQL endpoint, or we will inspect the payloads and just see that they look like GraphQL. It's the uh, hacker spirit. You have to know enough little things about a lot of things so you can identify things. And I said a lot of times the word things in that last thing. What comes next? You have identified that an application is using GraphQL. So yeah, hacker, what do you do next? Then you want to identify the schema of the GraphQL application. I will explain right after why it's one of the first thing you want to do, but we will use two techniques to identify the schema of a GraphQL application. The first one is abusing introspection. So GraphQL is very powerful and self-documenting, and a simple query could actually be used to identify the schema of a GraphQL application, depending on the implementation of the GraphQL server. So let's do a live demo because we are ambitious and mostly because we are not on a stage at a physical conference, but I am in the comfort of my home with my optic fiber conference uh, internet. So I hope that my, uh, that my live demo will work. So here I've got just a simple GraphQL endpoint. It enables me to track some kind of Dropbox-like application. When I've got users, I can fetch them by ID and I can get their name and I can identify their amount of disk usage. Uh, let's say that I want to check the billing and I've got these pieces of information. And because I have prepared my talk, I've got a query in my history that is named introspection query and to be honest, uh, that's where I circle back and not being a GraphQL expert. What a hacker will do, they will identify that your app uses GraphQL and they will Google how to hack GraphQL applications and they will see you should drop the schema. So they will Google how to drop the schema and they will find this query online. I did not write this query. I just copy pasted it from somewhere on GitHub and it works. You actually have knowledge about the query and you can drop the schema itself. You even have the documentation. So I told you about users in this app I built. Here you've got uh, the description of the query with the parameters so you know what query are valid. And then later you've got the uh, type of the user uh, where you can identify that's not what I want. I want the type of the user. It should be inside. Where is it? Okay, that's the demo epic fail. Here it is. Uh, I can have the details about the data model of the user. And most of the time, it's really close to the data model in database in smaller, country, uh, smaller companies. If you have a big, uh, in, if you have a big 
uh, infrastructure as uh, as the great previous talk displayed maybe it won't be one one with your database model but you learn a lot by digging into the data model of the graph of the application so well, that was the first live demo of this talk there will be a second one and that's the first advice i can give to anyone who has graphql in production is remove the schema remove the introspection because knowing the schema is actually something that you can know and i will show later how you can know the things about the schema without introspection but at the same time it makes the life easier for the hacker and you don't want that so in production you don't want the schema um, when i hack into a rest api or any other kind of apis it takes me time to identify what are the valid inputs for each endpoint. In GraphQL, it saves me usually half a day on a complex application. So I remember that my uh, web security, uh, computer security class at university started with hacking a system is just a game of time and money. If you've got infinite time and infinite money, you will hack into any system. And the question is, as a defensor, how do you make it very expensive in terms of time and money for your attacker to break into your app? So make them laugh hard because they might give up and lose hope. The other thing is a bit more sneaky. So I was, I was attacking pen testing this GraphQL application and I could not actually find the schema by introspection. Then I realized by browsing the front end website that in the graph, in the, in the, oof, in the React application, they were using this library named GraphQL tag. So I checked what it is on NPM. Don't forget, I'm a Node.js person. I speak NPM as my native language. And I found this library, which is basically a utils that helps you handle graph in the front end. And usually uh, people use that to handle pieces of graphs in the front end, pieces of the definition of the schema. So I see that this library is pretty popular. It has like 2 million weekly downloads, which is massive. And what I did is I went on a service that is named app.grep, a uh, grep.app that enables you to find basically grep anything on GitHub. And I identified a few hundreds of applications using this library. So I had a dirty script around it and I was able to dump the actual GraphQL schema of this application by accessing the code of their front end. And since it's front end code, it's something that runs into your client's browser or into your client's uh, mobile applications. So it's actually something you don't have any control and obscurity on. So that leads me to this other way to define, to find the schema of a GraphQL application, identify the client side code, and I use that to find what is the schema. So that breaks me to this hard truth. Your schema, or at least part of it, is public. That's something you need to accept. That's the web. And if you have developers who say they like security by obscurity, they are not security aware developer in my book. You still have to disable introspection because you want to make the hacker's life hard, but your schema is public. So anything in the information in that is public and there is no way you can keep that private for long. And the question is, okay, my schema is public, but why would a hacker use the schema to do anything? And that's where the hacker in me just goes into memeing into conference talks. So sorry about that. It's an old meme, but inject all the strings. And basically the internet is just a bunch of texts that gone wild and display things and the internet is about strings, meaning that a lot of things we do on the internet is about strings. And if you can inject arbitrary strings somewhere, you can find SQL injection, shell injections, evil injection, XSS, or any other kind of attacks that are screen, string based. And even if the, in the case where you just have a GraphQL BFF, 
uh, that queries other services, maybe by having string going through your, your first BFF, they will be spread to another unsafe API and you won't be protected. When you have an untrusted input getting into your app, you have to untrusted it all the way to the database, to anything it can do. And at this point, the method to protect against these attacks are just the same that in any other protocol. You want to use a prepare statement in your databases. You want to sanitize data input, as mentioned in the, uh, in the previous talk, to avoid XSS. You want to uh, escape anything that is reflected to avoid uh, to avoid ref reflective XSS. It's not because it's using GraphQL that there is no way you have a reflected XSS in a front end that does not sanitize the input it gets from the back end. So without further notice, let's go through the second live demo of this talk. And I hope this one will not fall apart either because for this one, I have less preparation. I mean, I don't have a pre-saved query. So let's remove all this garbage that I don't understand. And let's go back to a standard query for that one. So because I, have, I already know the schema, I know all the fields that I can use. Right now it's on the right hand side of my screen. So I will say that I want name. Sorry, this is not quite cool. So ID and disk usage. And why I selected the three ones is that because that's all the ones that are available. And as a hacker, I just want to see all the capabilities of the API. So I run this thing. And I have identified here an input string thing. So I will start to play with it. And the person who wrote this API is a terrible person. That's me. Because here I see that when I start to play with the value with legitimate like thing, I have a, some kind of weird output in the error, command failed, a, a shell command did not work. And if I had followed the, uh, uh, the advice from the previous talk, I would have hidden my uh, error when something happens, but for the sake of making my demo easier, I expect terrible developer on the other side. I know this terrible developer, it's myself. So I see that there is something in my input that is used to run a command. So I look back at the API and I'm like, hey, yeah, there is something like disk usage. How does this API compute disk usage for a certain user? Probably by running a shell command to ask the OS about this usage. So here I've got user IDs. Okay, so let's try to tamper with that. Okay, we have got the same issues as previous one, but here I see that the command run is du for this for getting the disk size. And here I've got the full path, and here I've got my input. So let's be hacky and do something like ls slash. And here, I don't have any error. The code is running properly. And in this usage, I've got 100k. Then I've got things like, hey, I've got slash v.jcm, slash tmp, slash documents, slash applications. And I was actually able to ask the server to give me the value of the command ls slash. So in that example, I'm just reading. And in terms of risk management in security, we use three vectors. We name CIA, no link with the agency. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And basically, when you have like what we call a shell injection, which is the attack I have now, everything is broken because I've got read writes with the user that is with the user writes that is user, uh, running the code. I've got um, writes writes with the same user and temporary uh, uh, and with that I can break uh, confidentiality. I can read any piece of data. I can break uh, integrity. I can modify any piece of data or, or availability. I can just restart the server or shut it down. So that's the vector you want to protect. And in that case, I've broken everything. Of course, if you've got, if you're not a terrible ops person, because I'm not only a terrible dev person, I'm also a terrible ops person, you run your code with a, 
unprivileged user that cannot tamper too much with the host machine. Okay, so now that I have injected all the strings, next thing I do is I inject all the objects. And here you're like, wait, what? In GraphQL, you cannot object objects. And that's actually true. Uh, GraphQL by default is not object injectable, but there is the custom Scala tip that can be used where you can extend and create custom basic tip in GraphQL. And actually one of them is very popular according to NPM, it's the JSON one. And if you can inject arbitrary objects into a server, you can perform NoSQL injections. This talk is not about NoSQL injections, but you can check screen blogs or my previous talks on that topic. I have talked about that extensively for two years a while ago. And also I found a very fun use case when some ORM are actually using NoSQL-like uh, language to do query. So you can NoSQL-like SQL databases, but that just may be having some weird uh, fun with APIs. Before we finish, because we have two minutes to go, uh, a quick word about user management. Um, with GraphQL, I found out by auditing real life application that it is really easy to do mistakes. GraphQL, it's really tempting to do the thing that is the cleanest. No context aware code, just answering services and not caring about the context. And I disagree with that view. I think anything that is linked to user must be checked, especially the more abstraction you use, the more you need to check user everywhere. In the past, when you had multiple endpoints, you would check endpoints by user. Here, it's more complicated. Of course, you have directives, you have a lot of features, but at the end of the day, just make your code user aware. For each time you are tampering with data, check if the user has the endpoint rights, they are allowed to perform this operation, but also data related rights. I am an admin, I have access to the list of users. I am a user, I have access to my own drafts. Am I allowed to read the draft of another user? Maybe. Am I allowed to edit them? Maybe not. So for each operation, make sure you know about the endpoint rights and the data related rights. Quick, let's go to a conclusion because we are reaching the 20 minutes limit. Disable introspection was my first thing I want you to take out of this talk. Limit query depth to prevent TOS. I did not talk at all about that because it's one of the first advice you get in terms of security for GraphQL, but especially in an environment when the resource is limited, a very slow GraphQL query can link to a denial of service. If you use Node.js, it's single threaded, so you are blocking all requests. If you are in a multi-threaded environment, you can make the server unresponsible, unresponsive with as many requests as you have uh, threads. And if you are in an elastic system, you can just hit when it's hard, I mean, the wallet and make the, API, the owner of the API lose money. So limit query depth and first timeout, you will be happy. If you want to see some hacking about around uh, query depth and long responses, you can check my uh, last my talks from last year at the OWASP conferences. There's something that's really cool with GraphQL is that you know your schema. So what I would recommend is you sit with your security person in your company and check the schema and everything that is sensitive, just ultra log everything and add more logs and be sure that you know what's happening. Highly untrust custom scalars because that's where you are in the freestyle world. Without custom scalar, you are into the GraphQL by the book thing with custom scalar. Nobody can save you from eternal doom. And on that words, thanks so much for your attention. Let's keep in touch. I'm available on Twitter or by email. And I think we might have time to take a couple of questions. Jesse will tell us. So not, not technically. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I think actually everybody was just too blown away by the talk. So there wasn't anything posted. If you have any questions, ping them on Twitter, message them here in this platform. A uh, fantastic talk. I just saw, really uh, thanks so much. I just saw a very quick question about the flag and my home yes. region flag. Take it. Uh, Take it's the flag of Alsace, which is this small region in the east of France that has been disputed between France and Germany. And at one point, we don't really know what we are. So I'm Alsatian before being from German or Swiss. So I'm pretty proud of that. And I find the flag pretty cool. Uh, that was just a story for the background. Thanks so much for being an amazing crowd. <laughs> Fantastic talk. Really excellent and a topic that everybody really needs to uh, needs to consider. So um, thank you much. Uh, next up, yeah. Next up, we have Vitali uh, Vitali Gordon, from CEO of Pharos AI. He was another uh, pinch hitter for the uh, the talk lineup. Uh, so I really appreciate him coming in. This talk should be really interesting. So automating developer operations is a topic that, I mean, hits all of us. So I'm excited to hear it. I'm not going to take up any more of the time. Vitali, floor is yours. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? We need to do this whole uh, video conference dance. Um, see me, hear me. Hopefully uh, everything's fine. Let me sc uh, share my screen. Um, kind of uh, uh, very quickly and see whether it works. So hopefully we tested this before. So automating, sorry, um, where is it? The screen, it disappeared. Oh, wow, sorry, my, uh, my entire thing uh, suddenly disappeared. Hopefully we can share it again. Okay, automating developer operations uh, with GraphQL. Uh, just a kind of quick background on me. I'm a CEO of a company called Ferris AI, but uh, prior to that, I was a co-founder of a project called uh, Salesforce Science, which is Salesforce machine learning platform. I was also running uh, machine learning engineering uh, at Salesforce and was working um, at LinkedIn as a senior data scientist. And I think one of the things that uh, I am not is uh, kind of you know a GraphQL or an API guru uh, like uh, some of the speakers uh, in this conference, but um, uh, I do um, have some uh, kind of interesting insights from uh, a user perspective of where did we find uh, that APIs and GraphQL in particular can solve kind of real uh, problems. So the story really begins when I was um, at Salesforce. I was running an engineering team of about. Um, uh, about 150 uh, uh, people and you know running an engineering organization at that scale uh, comes with a lot of uh, uh, with a lot of problems and uh, more specifically we found out that a lot of the problems were uh, especially around our developer uh, operations uh, area and this is what really kind of was the bottleneck for the entire uh, organization and I started to think, like, why really engineering is so much harder than what it appears to be in, you know, many other, like, you know, sales, marketing. Like, what is this nature of complexity? And one of the, at least the theories I developed, and it will be great if, like, the slides would move. And uh, one second. Sorry about that. So if you uh, if you look at these um, kind of acronym that you might know some of them ERP CRM um, HRM so on and so forth these are systems that people use to do their daily job like CRM is a customer relationship management system that is the system that salespeople uh, use obviously Salesforce being one of the most uh, known uh, examples of a CRM system HRM is a human resource management system Workday can be one but there is uh, plenty of others. ATS is an applicant tracking system for recruiters. That's where they track. And, and the point we realize is actually like a lot of these professions kind of really converge on using this one system for to do pretty much all of their, uh, their entire work. And if you look at all of these systems, they also tend to have um, a very similar kind of uh, architecture that is also known as a free tier architecture where you have a data layer you have an application layer and you have um, a presentation layer and really most of the interaction uh, even as more and more systems come in tend to actually use that system as a funnel. so at the bottom you can imagine it's additional data sources that usually integrate into the data layer and then you have additional kind of you know processes or kind of 
business process or reports that usually kind of interact with the presentation layer and application layer. But then something had happened and really the systems stopped looking at this and you, uh, we start seeing system, especially in the developer and developer operation space where we don't have one, this one giant centralized system for everything, but really we have a lot of fragmented uh, systems that actually uh, and a lot of them, you know, even if they have a presentation layer, really the interaction with them is mostly through and uh, certain of API layer. And kind of the presentation layer is just kind of you know a nice to have for administration and other things. And you know some of the system here you can see on the slide if it's you know Datadog or GitHub or AWS. And obviously AWS by itself is not just one service; it's hundreds of different services. And and the problem that started emerging is when you start trying to solve a specific business use case, like these are what these uh, kind of uh, blue boxes represent, like employee of boring or cost optimization, you now start to integrate with multiple systems and really try to solve kind of um, an API problem by connecting to multiple systems, getting all the data, you know, sometimes storing it, sometimes not, and really figuring out like the authentication, pagination, and every one of these APIs is structured differently. Some of them use standards, some of them you know, like uh, open API, some of them, some of them don't. And really, kind of the world beca became kind of this mess where, and a lot, um, a lot of the work really started to be to be around this like boilerplate, which is really about the connectivity to the API, where the logic has actually became kind of a lower and lower percentage of the work that is actually uh, being done. And really, what we do at Ferris, and you know, this is a kind of a, uh, apologies for the shameless plug, is uh, connecting all these uh, sources together into kind of one system, so people can uh, can build uh, their application on top of it. But since this is a kind of GraphQL talk, uh, let me just quickly uh, jump uh, to a demo of uh, kind of how this thing uh, might look like. Um, so this is just kind of our website. You can go to it, you can look at it. But um, what I want to show is kind of the GraphQL Explorer. If you ever used GraphQL, you know there is an Explorer that comes in. And uh, as you can see here, we kind of connect. Uh, in this account, I've connected uh, multiple uh, systems. But we're adding kind of more and more uh, with each day. But one of the really nice about um, um, kind of GraphQL that there is a schema with it and with tools for like GraphQL Explorer. This is just a vanilla GraphQL Explorer. We just integrated into our website for uh, kind of mostly authentication issues. Um, kind of so you don't have to worry about it. And we added this login log out button. But now for the first time, you can actually kind of start seeing your data in a, in a way that most APIs don't provide you. And this is kind of really the magic and power of GraphQL. As you can see, AWS has you know, additional services inside and they have kind of here IAM, EC2 and all that. And what we actually are doing is we're collecting kind of information in, in EC2, you can see a lot of other things. So for example, I can click instances and actually, like we are also collecting that data, um, unlike, for example, the Amazon APIs, which is also problematic, where if the API forces you to actually um, execute every single query uh, with a specific account with a specific region uh, ID. Here, uh, as you can see, uh, if we just add, let's say, instance ID, instance type, um, you can just see that these two uh, instances uh, come from different regions. So we can actually collect and start enhancing an API for something that the actual real vanilla API does not provide that functionality because we're using kind of uh, this distributed system on, uh, on top of it. Uh, we're, by the way, using Fauna DB. Um, so uh, what also now uh, kind of happens, we can actually start joining different APIs. So Amazon uh, Web Services altogether, and this is just one example, has about 20,000 APIs. So just imagine like what is cognitive load requires to just know these APIs with all their parameters. And one of the nice things about GraphQL is you don't really need, like, for example, uh, for those of you who know a little bit about infrastructure, uh, EC2, which are instances, come will also attach with volumes uh, to store your data. And again, a volume will require you to call a completely different API, and you might not even know. But here you can look at the instance data, and you can see that, oh, you know, there are volumes here that are attached to this in these instances. Like, you don't have to create the join because the GraphQL layer actually provides you and uh, provides you this. And then you can start also now not just actually exposing the data and joining, you can start decorating the data with additional information. Like one popular, uh, very popular use case with all of these cloud providers 
is, for example, pricing information. So now we can start uh, looking at you know, pricing. And in this case, we can see that this is one, even though this is a T2 micro, this costs about seven cents per hour. And this the exact same instance actually costs only one cent per hour. And you can kind of you know, start reasoning more about the type of infrastructure uh, that you use. And the price is actually, again, um, extremely, um, uh, kind of extremely relevant because we are, in order to decorate, we are using all of uh, all of the information that is available because the pricing is based on the type of instance, the the things that they, it has installed in, and the, and the region where this instance operates, and you know many other parameters. But you just get it with the click. And the cool thing about it, what we're working with developer operations people that actually don't know GraphQL, that this is not uh, a tool that they use, but they really have no there is no reason for them to learn the syntax because you can actually like just click your way into designing uh, the query and another thing is just you know uh, you can look at all your certificates and so on and so forth um, and kind of odd, uh, other things and uh, let's say there is a certificate there is one important thing is expiration like for example if you have a certificate that is about to expire uh, you want to know that but unfortunately like for example graphql is not great for uh, for things uh, like um uh, ad adding additional logic around let's say you know uh, comparing dates. So for this, we uh, we need to expand a little bit the syntax of GraphQL in, in order to do that. And we want to do it in a way that will be comfortable uh, to developers, but actually by using still um, kind of idiomatic graphical uh, concepts. So for those of you who, um, again, work with GraphQL, you folks know that there is the concept of resolvers where you can um, kind of add uh, additional code. So we kind of thought, how can I actually you kind of provide the functionality of graphical resolvers, but without actually having people implementing graphical resolvers, because this is not the level of, of, of functionality that I want to provide them kind of to kind of to to be able to modify my APIs, but I really want them to be able to kind of customize um, the API a little bit, but kind of make it in a, a safer in a safer way. So what we came up with, and this is kind of we have here also um uh, this is a public or a github repository where we have kind of a bunch of useful uh, things that people are have done on our api and contributed but let's look at this like acm expiring certificate and here there's just python code um that people can extend which is basically just uh, it's powered by aws lambda behind the scenes and as you can see this is a very similar query to the one i just wrote but in this case, we actually want to know all the certificates that are, you know, expiring in, you know, kind of this um, days left parameter days. So, for example, um, kind of, uh, you know, I want to know whether I have a, any expiring certificate in 30 days. And I want to do something about it if this is kind of true. So now we also have kind of a Lambda, which is basically another REST API, which can also be called for a GraphQL um, uh, interface. And uh, people can now add additional logic that GraphQL uh, does not support uh, out of the box. So for example, how one might call this API, like I said, because this is Lambda that is available, you can just use Postman or curl or call it. But actually, we want to uh, make it even uh, simpler uh, for people. Uh, so people can use our, uh, our CLI to call it. But you know something that would be even cooler is if they can use um, kind of this uh, Slack. So let me just do uh, first login. I think it's uh, so uh, we try to associate for security purpose uh, purposes kind of um, the Slack Slack user with the user of our platform. So not everyone who has access to the bot can execute everything on the infrastructure. And but here you can first list, um, and this is kind of a new feature, so it might not work perfectly. And as you can see here, uh, great job for engineers. You can see all of these uh, apps that I just showed you on the GitHub repo. And let's say if I want this ACM expiring certificate, I can actually um, do a slash command, which is Ferris app in invoke. And we also, the dash G is because it's a global app. And then we have a parameter here that says days left, let's say 300, uh, because I, uh, just to show you that it actually returns some results. And if I typed it correctly, we actually got, you know, two 
that expire in April of 2021. So obviously this is not something I need to do about now, but if let's say this was um, not Paris app invoke, uh, sorry, I see everything here, the sheet, uh, days left equals 30, which is kind of a little bit more closer to my comfort level, you see that I just got, a, 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 I got an empty response for which of these. And the, this is again, um, how can you extend the functionality of GraphQL by, uh, by, co uh, by kind of adding Python code? So it kind of worked as a resolver, but without actually us uh, uh, giving access to users to our kind of own resolver, but actually adding their own resolvers on top of it and really enhancing the GraphQL schema with additional, uh, uh, additional functionality. But Obviously, this is also uh, might not be enough because it's not just enough to do uh, to kind of have the data. And this is where really the power of APIs comes in because everything I showed so far are basically RESTful APIs. You can connect whatever you want. So you might want to connect an orchestration uh, system like no domain. And here you can see there's no domain. And I won't kind of go uh, through this uh, too much, but as you can see here, you can start uh, invoking something from a trigger that might be time-based, might be event-based, might be you just call it from Slack, that executes some graphical query, then add some you know uh, HTTP request, and then if it find if, uh, which is kind of our lambda, and if it found uh, that there were results, uh, it, I want it to no both notify me on Slack, but also kind of open a Jira ticket, and and really kind of automating. Uh, uh, the creation of Jira task, and then obviously the Jira ticket can uh, have a follow-on um, uh, resolution. And you know, this is kind of uh, every organization uh, can have whatever business process they want. And also, this is something that very nice that comes in with about I think two hundred other um, kind of actions that you might take. Uh, you might take, and this is how you start with really creating uh, more and more um, automation, which is you know, very easy, very visual. And really what we're trying to aim for is that 100% of really the, the logic would be um, the actual business problem that you are trying to solve as opposed to kind of working with kind of boilerplate uh, API integration and all the data munging uh, across it. Um, so I'll... Uh, stop sharing and I'll just leave more room for questions for anyone that might have them. Sorry, you took me by surprise for having a speaker actually end on time with rumor speaker for questions. <laughs> uh, fantastic. I mean, this this is exactly the kind of stuff that this community needs to connect these different services together, building this uh, this data graph amongst all of your services is really quite impressive. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience? Let's, uh, let's go ahead and open that up here. Yeah, so while the audience uh, kind of uh, thinks about questions, I can share kind of what are other things that, um, you know, people, uh, people are doing. Uh, one uh, one thing that uh, I mentioned is like, for example, employee of boring. So a lot of um, organization, I'm sure uh, each and every one of you work in at least one organization that whenever an employee leaves the organization, you have this um, kind of long uh, spreadsheet of all the system that you have to like remove that employee uh, from. Obviously, you know, a lot of these things become better with kind of single sign-on solution, but even that usually does not solve uh, the problem kind of 100%. And that is like a classic thing that you want to uh, automate where, you know, the biggest offender, for example, is GitHub, where people usually bring their kind of personal accounts into the workspace, like unlike email, right? Which is kind of easier to control. Um, and uh, some, other thing is also kind of a, a very simple uh, things like um, uh, knowing who's um, uh, who's on call right now. Where this data usually sits on pager duty, and really most developers and also DevOps people really don't like to go and start clicking on system and like work with their UI. So, for example, like creating a you know a Slack bot that just you know pings pager duty and says, "Hey, who's on call right now for this service?" But even better is uh, we have uh, some customers that implemented um, a, a complete end-to-end -end Slack, uh, Slack automation where really they you know, have Slack handles 
that every time there is a shift change on PagerDuty, the Slack handle changes of the the person that you know uh, the message needs to be route, routed to. Um, uh, additional kind of examples are people who are um, uh, working uh, the communication layer between, let's say, the developer organization and the infrastructure organization goes through a ticketing system. Like it's usually a larger organization where people used to ping each other for email and Slack, but then they said, oh, we, you know, for compliance purposes or some other, we need to have an audit log of all the changes that we make in production environments. And we need that audit log, um, let's say, you know, in Jira or something like that. And usually what happens is like a lot of time people, by typing, they make mistakes, and they really what they need to type is very um, kind of it's very robotic. It's not it just they like they, the person on the other side just needs the correct information, the, the correct fields. It's not that there is like very you know, uh, and they're done thousands of these tickets. But every time people do them manually, um, these tickets miss some missing information, or you know, it just takes too long. So uh, so an automation might be if really what I need to do like is is a change that is a kind of, let's say, a result of me changing some code, then why not actually me going to GitHub or GitLab, making that change there and having the Jira ticket like open as uh, kind of automatically as a, you know, kind of event that uh, is a is a result uh, of that as opposed to me going and really implementing these two changes in two different languages and two different systems. And sometimes the number is more than two. That's um, that's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you, if, I'm sure a lot of our audience has had experience trying to connect these things together, and the boilerplate just becomes so immense and so brittle. And and uh, being able to string together these optimal workflows is really the really the ideal. And um, that's great. I'm going to throw it up one last time for questions out of the audience. Otherwise, I'd say we'll we'll go ahead and break uh, for break early. But give this uh, one more minute here. Any any specific questions? Even even at the home audience, the uh, last speaker before break, everybody's wanting to rush to the coffee machine. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah. everyone. Uh, yeah. Thank you. For your for your for my side, I want, I want a question for your platform. Yeah. Which is, do you have a, do you like a developer account or what's the yeah? You to... just don't need you. You literally just go to Ferris.ai, click start button. It's actually we just launched it a couple of weeks ago, and and it's still you know completely completely free. While we're kind of working with more companies to figure out the use cases. Just started, and we have a community Slack where you can ask questions, and we have kind of a, a documentation that is never as extensive as it should be. Um, it's like we're unfortunately our developers uh, much prefer developing new features uh, rather than uh, documenting them. So that's uh, that's why we have the Slack for as well. But we're gonna improve on that as well, and really kind of just um, check out uh, Ferris.ai and would love for to hear any kind of uh, comments people might have. Fantastic. Yeah. And you're on Twitter as well, so they can find you. And yes. You at, and... at Vitaly Gorin on Twitter. And you saw my email as well on the talk. Very good. Thanks so much for joining us. And we will break. The next talk picks up again at 1220 uh, or 920 if you're in the uh, Central European time zone. And that will be a really fascinating talk as well uh, from, from Amit Sumali uh, uh, from Tyke about securing GraphQL APIs uh, for the universal data graph. So that will, it also promises to be fascinating. Break time, get some coffee, uh, stretch those legs, and uh, we'll meet back in 20 minutes. <laughs>